Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So far, so good. Verse 6, whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Now, at first reading, I think many of us would say, wow, that's a sobering verse. In fact, let's read it together just to kind of let it sink in because we all are going to need to take some notes tonight. Verse 6, ready, begin. Whosoever abideth in him, whosoever sinneth, hath not seen him, neither known him. Let's pray. Father, thank you that every word is the infallible word of God. Thank you for the beautiful and wonderful day today and for the things you're teaching us. Bless the song and then the time in the word tonight, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The Apostle John begins this epistle with the theme of fellowship. And for several weeks, we learned about the fellowship we have in Christ. And then in chapters 3 through 5, the theme shifts to the theme of sonship our relationship as born-again believers. What does it mean to be in Christ, abiding with Christ, a part of the family of God? And as this theme is introduced here in the opening verses of chapter 3, we come immediately to the theme of sonship and uh, the fact that we are the sons and daughters of God. In fact, in verse 1, we saw a few weeks ago, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. And tonight, uh, we're going to learn from our text uh, that there are certain essential uh, understandings doctrinally about our relationship to Christ. First, those which we experience by faith in Him. uh, And then secondly, those we experience as we continue to walk in Him. And so it's all about our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Now notice if you would as we begin tonight in verse 4 as we learn about this relationship of sonship that there is first of all the declaration of sin. There is a declaration made uh, in verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law for sin is the transgression of the law. We see the declaration of sin in the phrase, uh, whosoever committeth sin. We see the declaration here as a transgression of the law. So notice the transgression of the law. Sin is a violation of the law. Whoso committeth sin, uh, anyone who commits sin. The word sin here is the Greek word hamartia, which means to miss the mark. And how many of you understand God's mark is perfection? For all have come short of the glory of God. So sin is a violation of the law. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. This phrase, transgression also of the law, transgressing of the law, uh, speaks about uh, our uh, position as sinners uh, and before we're saved or even after we save when we uh, sin we're transgressing against the law and so we see here in verse 4 whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law for sin is the transgression of the law now notice that phrase in verse 4 the second half let's just say it together please ready begin for sin is the transgression of the law Say it again. For sin. Now, I was having some fellowship uh, with uh, our friend Tim uh, Tim and Kelly Rasmussen last week. Terry and I were talking with them, and I was talking to uh, Pastor Tim about this passage, and I, I was saying, I'm coming up on 1 John chapter 3 and verse 6, and, and uh, I got out my iPhone, and I started reading it to him, and I and, uh, said, how, how do you deal with this? And he said, I, I've never, no, he didn't say he never tried it, Brother Rasmussen. He's not a quitter. Don't tell him I'm, I said he's a quitter. He gave me his thoughts on it. But one of the things he said about this verse, and I thought it was wonderful. He said, you know, Brother Chapel, I've never led a person to Christ in recent years without reading to them 1 John 3, 4. 1 John 3, 4. Now, all of us read Romans 3.10, Romans 3.23, and we explain to people that they fall short of the glory of God. 
And so I said, you read verse 4 when you lead someone to Christ. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law. He said, it's important for someone that is not yet saved to realize that sin is a transgression against God's law. He, he said, in fact, sometimes I'll even read to them the Ten Commandments. He said, I'll literally read to them each and every one of the Ten Commandments so that they understand what it is to transgress against the law of God. And he said, normally, by the time you read through those, someone is beginning to realize they fall short of the glory of God. Listen, when we're witnessing to people, we don't want to act like they're, they're kind of okay, but not really okay. But if they just add Jesus to the repertoire, everything's okay. No, no, no. They need to realize that they are transgressors and Jesus is not a part of the repertoire. He is the only way of salvation. Sometimes I hear the way that certain uh, uh, televangelists give the gospel message, and it's very loosey-goosey. And so what we see here concerning our sonship uh, as our relationship with God is that as sinners, we are transgressor, transgressors of the law. Romans 7, 7 says it this way, what shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. In other words, some people say, well, hey, if, I, if I'm a transgressor because of the law, then get away with the law. I don't want to hear what the Bible has to say. No, no, no. The, the Bible's not the problem. The sin of my heart's the problem. And so Romans 7, 7, uh, nay, I had not known sin, but by the law, for I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So the law is not sin, but it gives us knowledge of what sin is according to God. So we see that there is the transgression of the law and that our sin is rebellion against God. Ephesians 2 and verse 2, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And so, as sinners before salvation and after salvation, we, when we sin, are, we're not breaking the rule of the church. Look at, uh, I don't want that to be the first thought in the mind of our teenagers. I hope we have some guidelines that are biblically based. I don't want to offend the testimony of my church, but it's deeper than that. Sin is a transgression against the law of God. And so when I sin, I'm transgressing against the law. And there's a penalty to that as, as it pertains to the unsaved. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And may I say that even in the life of the believer, though you are saved and you may not experience eternal damnation, uh, that there is a decaying, rotting effect to allowing sin to stay in our lives. So sin is the transgression of the law. There's a penalty to sin. The ultimate penalty, Revelation 20 and verse 14, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the Lamb's book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So uh, in order to understand the place that we are seated in the family of God as sons of God, we need to understand where we are without God. And that is we are declared guilty by the law. That's the declaration of sin. And we understand that. But notice secondly tonight, the manifestation of Christ. So we go from the negative in verse 4 to the positive in verse 5. Notice here, and ye know that he, Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. So verse 4, Four tells me why I need a redeemer. And that's why Pastor Tim uses verse 4 when he's soul winning because he believes that people need a redeemer and we all believe that everyone needs a redeemer. And so verse 4 tells us we need a redeemer. Verse 5 tells me that the redeemer has been provided and of course that is Jesus Christ. It says, and ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And so uh, we understand then that God came in person so that we uh, who had offended the law of God, who had transgressed against the law of God, that we might have salvation. And so notice what it says again in verse 5. It says that he was manifested, manifested to make visible, to make known by words and by deeds. God became flesh and dwelt among us. He was manifested in our uh, human race on planet earth. First John four. Notice if you would in verse number nine, it says, in this was manifested the love of God toward us 
Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he first loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So we see the word manifested in this chapter on these two different occasions, verse 5 and rather in verse 4 and verses uh, 9 through 11. We see this principle of the manifestation of the love of God, meaning God came in person to us. Jesus Christ revealed himself in physical flesh as the Son of God bodily. He was deity wrapped in humanity. And why did he manifest himself? Notice in verse 5. He was manifested to take away our sins. Let's say that together. To take any church that says that water from the baptistry can take away sin. Any church that says you can be baptized for your dead loved ones. Any church that says you must keep the sacraments. Any church that says you must beat yourself or crawl up the stairs until your knees are bloody in order to appease God, in order to get your sins taken care of, is a blasphemous church. There is only one that can take away our sin, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to take away our sin. And what a wonderful truth. He was manifested to take away our sin. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For he, God the Father, hath made him, God the Son, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God through him. And so God the Father made him, God the Son, to be sin for us. Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary as the manifested uh, Son of God. He became sin for us. He took sin upon himself. Though he knew no sin, though he never did covet, though he never did lust, despite what the blasphemous, universal, satanic, universal studio said, Jesus never coveted or lusted or sinned. The one that knew no sin was manifested in perfection, took our sin that we might be declared righteous, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I can still remember my granddad who was saved uh, as, a, as a missionary, came to his farm, and he had, my granddad never had more than an eighth, eighth grade education, and he was gloriously saved out on that farm, and, and he began to read the book of Romans until he memorized every single word of that book of Romans. And I remember driving along the fields with him in the pickup truck, and he'd start quoting Romans 1 and Romans 2 and Romans 3, and then, boy, he'd get into chapter 4 and 5, and he'd start getting into, but God commendeth, and he'd start explaining propitiation to me, and he would start declaring that God had declared him righteous through the finished work of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ, he'd slap his leg, he'd slap my leg, he'd say, boy, isn't that good? And by the way, it is good. So many times we've got poker face Baptists who've got their concentration on every kind of a silly thing other than the most important thing. The most important thing is that God was manifest in the flesh and he died on an old rugged cross for your sin and mine. Don't ever get over the joy of that. We see his incarnation. We see his propitiation. Notice what it says here in verse 5. To take away our sins. Oh, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. You see, all the law could ever do was condemn us. All we could ever do with the law is fail. If we fail in one point of the law, it's like we fail in every point of the law. All the law could do was say you're a failure. But Jesus said, I love you despite your failure. And he shed his blood for my failure and your failure and for our sin. And he was manifest on that cross so that we might have redemption. And he was without sin, the Bible says in verse 5. In him is no sin. In him is no sin. And so I see the declaration of sin. Sin, the Bible says, is manifested to us in the fact that we transgress against the law. I see the manifestation of Christ in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now then, these are wonderful truths. I could preach on those truths uh, every single moment of every single day and never extol the grace of God enough. 
And so we see the declaration of sin, and most of us concur with that truth. We see the manifestation of Christ, and most of us say, I'm undeserving, and I'm grateful that Jesus would love me in that way. But now, verse 6 comes to the walk of the believer. And we're going to see it's a very sober verse 6. Because too many people, they see that they're a sinner, they know that. They hear the gospel, thankfully, and they, they receive Christ, and they're glad that they have been declared righteous. And that's kind of where it ends. They're in the family, but they're not really walking with the Father. They're not really living as a son or a daughter. They are positionally. But they're really not walking with the Father. And so we come from the theological tenets of salvation to the practical application of living like a son. Now, I'm thankful tonight to be a son or a child of God, aren't you? And I believe that there can be a sense of family pride that you might have, and it might revolve around the history of your family, and it might not. It might revolve around the culture or the food or some things that, you know, you can talk about that are fun and and that are a part of your history, your DNA. But I think every one of us here, no matter your pedigree, would have to say, really, my pedigree is tainted with sin. The only thing that matters is that I'm a child of God. That's really what matters. And so what about how this gospel should affect the way we live? Let's jump into this. Notice in verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, I, I would imagine if I were to sit down with some of you after church tonight and we were to visit for a minute and I would say, when you first heard that, or maybe when you first read it in your devotions, that was maybe a little heavy, somebody might say. That caused a question in their mind. If I'm in him, if I abide in him, I'm not going to sin. What's missing here? Whosoever is used six times, pos, this word in 1 John is found, and it, of course, means every single one of us. So this, there's no, like, loophole here. Now, there have been groups that have taught from this very verse, I believe incorrectly, a doctrine known as sinless perfection. <laughs> Isn't that something? They, they, would, they would extract from this and they would say that if you're truly saved, you will never sin. And I've only been at it preaching for about 40 years, pastoring here for about 35 years. I've met thousands of saved people and some really great saved people. And some of the greatest, most godly people that I've ever known were also sinful people. There's only one in my conviction that is sinless, and his name is Jesus Christ. So... I do not derive from this passage the doctrine of sinless perfection. To teach that doctrine would be contrary to what we know in human experience and also what we know in scriptural evidence. Even the Apostle Paul, Philippians 3.12 said, Not as though I have already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Paul, the apostle, was not condoning sin. He was not saying, I'm a habitual liar, habitual sinner. He was not saying that. He was just saying, I, I haven't apprehended. I have not yet attained. I'm not perfect. And by the way, when you meet a Christian that appears to be so perfect that they can spend their days bringing out the flaws in your life. Don't let them discourage you. They are not perfect either. Paul made it clear that he did not live a sinless life. He was very clear regarding his life that he had not attained. And when we observe closely the lives of those who, those who say that they live above sin, we come to see that what they profess with their lips is not what they're practicing with their lives. 
So, the law condemns, Jesus saves, but what about our life as a believer? What do you do with verse 6? Well, I believe what God is calling us to in verse 6 is an abiding relationship with him. I believe the tense in this verse speaks to a continual abiding, that to which God has called us. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. We see here the reality and the importance of abiding in Christ. Not to keep our salvation, but abiding in Christ in fellowship. 1 John 2, 28. And now, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Now, I love the word abide. It's a word that means to remain. It's a sense of constantly fellowshipping with him, having relationship with him. And the reality is that God did not save you so that you could say, well, I I was a transgressor of the law. I got that. Jesus Christ manifested himself so I could get saved. I get that. I asked Jesus to save me. Check the box. Been there, done that. Got the t-shirt. I'm going to heaven. Let the good times roll. God did not save you so that you could simply live your best life now. He promises abundant life. He's going to bless you. But God wants fellowship with you. He wants to live through you. And he wants your life and mine as we abide with him to bear the fruit of that relationship. You know, I've said for years, nearness is likeness. Say that, would you? You can often tell by watching people, if, if they're with a friend that's starting to put something in their ear, or, or a friend that's living a life of disobedience, and, and they're getting real close together, pretty soon the nearness is likeness. They're kind of reflecting their company. Folks, should not the presence of Jesus in our lives be reflected with a different way of living? Shouldn't you be different than the average cop or realtor or construction worker or nurse or aerospace guy? The reality of abiding is what we're called to in this verse. The result of of abiding is seen in verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. An abiding Christian will not sin. A Christian in the state of abiding will not sin. The incarnation brought into the world one who is totally sinless. If you agree with that, say amen. The incarnation brought into the world one who is totally sinless and who had as an objective the removal of sin from the lives of his own. It follows then logically, one author said from this, that a person who abides in a sinless person must himself be sinless, for he is sinless. He has the regenerate nature now of the sinless one in himself. How can one claim to have the perfectly sinless Son of God living in them and yet live in a constant sinful pattern of life without conviction, without a second thought. How can Jesus, the sinless one, be in the life of someone who keeps on sinning and never looks back? You have a nature, and I have a nature that is called a new nature in Christ. 1 John 3, 9, notice it. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now we're going to see in a moment the tense of these verbs, and we're going to understand that what we're studying here is the continual, habitual life of sin that is unbroken, and there is no repentance for it. God says you can't be saved and live that way. But your new nature, that 
uh, nature of Christ within you is not going to be a, a, a given to sin. It cannot. It is the nature of Jesus Christ within you. It's not capable of sin. Though our flesh may still cause us to sin, the new nature from God cannot sin. And so as I abide in him, my new nature will be reflected in my everyday life. When I neglect him, yes, I can fall into sin. The flesh faileth, and that does happen in the lives of Christians. We'll see in a moment. When it does, there should be conviction. There should be repentance in the life of a believer. There may even be the chastisement that comes into their life that Hebrews speaks about uh, because God will not let his children, his true children, live a life of continual sin without trying to bring them back into fellowship. John taught that no one who is living a life of sin consistently, constantly, is at that time abiding in Christ. It is not that people who become Christians will never sin, but that they will not live as they did because no one who sins consistently, habitually, in the pattern of the unregenerate, can honestly say that they know him. There should be a change. There should be a difference in the life of the believer. John further cautioned his readers here that they should make sure no one deceive them concerning uh, this misunderstanding of the sanctified life. That is to say that because you have made a profession that you can just live however you want to live, denying the presence of Jesus Christ. You know, sometimes it's awkward. Maybe you've been in a situation where you came into someone's home or into their business and you know this someone, you've met them before, but they act like you're not there. Have you ever had that happen? They're over here, you know them, they're with someone else. There's someone else that they're with, this guy doesn't want you to know that he knows you. And so you're walking over, and this other guy, he's kind of like acting like he doesn't know you. How many of you would agree with me? That's awkward. When someone acts like they don't know you. You cannot have Jesus in your heart and never acknowledge his presence at the same time. If you are truly saved, you will acknowledge the presence of Jesus Christ. The new nature cannot sin, but believers who yield to the old nature will stumble in sin. So this verse is not saying that you will never sin. It is saying that if you are abiding in him, you will not live a habitual life of sin. You may have times where you have a wrong thought. You may then repent of that and continue on in fellowship, but you will not stay in that sinful pattern. Turn, if you would, to Galatians 6 just for a quick moment. Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, this passage speaks of sin. If a man is overtaken in a sin, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself also, lest thou also be tempted. So, if a man be overtaken in a fault, we have all seen Christians that are overtaken in a fault. Maybe it's a stronghold from the past. Maybe there was a time when they got out of church during COVID. They didn't have their devotions. They got a little bit weak. And then the old habit, somebody offered them a drink. Somebody offered this or that. And before you know it, they stumbled into sin. And, and it was uh, uh, something that they were overtaken in a fault. If, if this verse is teaching sinless perfection, then the Bible would not say in Galatians 6, you which are spiritual, go restore them. The Bible would say, go lead them to Christ. If you're with me, say amen. amen. Saved people can be overtaken in a fault. But saved people do not say to the one trying to help them out, nuts to you. I like the way I'm living. I didn't believe it in the first place. I'm never going back to church. Someone that is saved can be restored as the Lord works in their heart. Now, there's a secondary, I think, application of this passage in the light of the context of the Gnosticism that was present in these churches. I will say that an abiding Christian not only will be alive to the new nature and will repent when the old nature manifests, but an abiding Christian will not deny 
the doctrine of the incarnation or the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Gnostics were doing. The Gnostics were denying the physical body incarnation of Jesus. And one of the sins that could have been committed in the early church was the denial of that doctrine as the Gnostics were teaching. A believer could be deceived by some false teachings, but a believer would never deny the doctrine of the Lord Jesus Christ. A true believer will abide in the truth of Christ and in the person of Christ. So a believer may be a little mixed up on some certain teachings of the Bible here and there. They may stumble and fall uh, and sin here and there. But a believer is someone that will still seek the truth, will still want to abide in Christ. They'll feel convicted when they sin. They'll be corrected when their doctrine is wrong because they are abiding in Christ. Listen, folks, this idea of just getting saved and it's enough, that's not God's plan. His plan is that we would abide in Him. 1 John 2, 29. If ye know that He is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of Him. That fruit that we call the fruit of the Spirit, that is of Him. That is of His Spirit. And so the emphasis of the Apostle's statement here is on sanctification, which true Christians who have the Holy Spirit and a transformed life will, will evidence through their life as they abide in Christ. There's not a pattern of sin. There is a pattern that shows forth the sinless one lives in me and I'm near him and I love him and I'm in him and he's in me and that means that my life is changing more and more like his life. Verse 6, having said all that, look at it again. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Now, let me give it to you in redneck vernacular. Someone that is saved might trip and fall into the pig pen. And it's a mess. All the pig stuff and the stinky water, all of it. And if you're saved, you want to get up as quick as you can and take a bath by reading the word and prayer of repentance. But if someone were to fall into that pig pen and go, hoo-hoo, this is awesome. Pig urine. This is great. Most of us would go, there are a few screws loose. When someone can consistently grieve God, live in sin, live in sin, live in sin, just loving it up in an unbroken pattern, without ever feeling convicted about it, there is a very good reason to believe they were never saved. And that, my friends, is a sobering thought. Because if you're abiding in Christ, you're not living in a life of sin. Will you fall down sometimes? Will you get angry? Will you have a wrong thought? Yes. Paul said, I've not attained. Paul said, you might have to go restore some of those that fell. There will be times like that. But when someone who was a member of a church even, all of a sudden they go back to their old ways and it's just on and there's no repentance, there's no remorse. The whole world is wrong, but they are not wrong. It could be that they never truly got saved. I remember Dr. Gatch preaching years ago and... Uh, Brother Getch is a blessing. He's here tonight. And I remember back in those old days, Brother Getch, when you stayed at our house during those early revival meetings. And as many of you know, Brother Getch, at that time, he was a runner. And uh, I remember, uh, I think it might have been a Monday morning, I said, hey, how about if I run with you, Brother Getch? Brother Getch, very accommodating, sure, whatever. <laughs> Actually, I think, I thought it was jogging. It's running. It wasn't jogging. And I, I think I lasted like around the block one time. But we used to have some fellowship along those days and around the subject of church meetings and such. And Brother Getch, I remember he said to me one time, he said, sometimes I wonder if 50% of the members of a Baptist church are saved. 
Now, I've never been one to judge someone's salvation, nor has Dr. Getch. We can't say who's saved. I don't know everyone's schedule well enough to know who's living in an unbroken, habitual life of sin. I don't, I, I'd have to be with someone 24-7 to really even get an eyewitness of that. I know that there's never been a day in the history of our church when we've had 50% of our members in church. I know that as a shepherd, I spend a good deal of time with our staff trying to find people who say that the risen Son of God lives within them. I know that there are many people who professed faith in Christ who, like Judas Iscariot, no longer walk with Christ. Now, I have no one in mind. I'm just saying tonight, how serious is this? To abide in Christ is so important. Not only because we need his fellowship, but also because the Bible is clear here that if we abide in him, we sin not. You can't be dwelling on his work at the cross and the blood atonement and his love for you and his word and at the same moment be living a life of willful sin. So this speaks of abiding relationship. And then secondly, it mentions a solemn reality. Notice this in verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him. Now again, this is the person that is living a life that is unregenerate. They either are the person that never made a profession or perhaps made a false profession, and now they live a life of continual, unbroken, unrepentant sin, violating the law, violating the law, violating the law, care less about it. The Bible says concerning this person that if they sin, if they sineth, again, the tense would teach us here, a continual life of sin. Whosoever's just, that's what they're known for, just sin. They're living this life of sin. The Bible says, whosoever sinneth, living in the continual state of sin, they, don't, they haven't seen him. They don't know him. They don't know who Christ is. Now, I'm going to tell you something. This is frightening. I know tour guides in Israel who are not believers, who know more Bible than most of us tonight. Knowing Bible verses does not save you. Getting a Sunday school pin does not save you. Living a good life does not save you. I'm not implying that. But if you have received Christ as your Savior and you're abiding in Him, your life won't be known uh, as the totality of life, a sinful life that never felt the conviction of God. The sin of rejecting Christ is, is a terrible thing. The sin of rejecting that Jesus has come in the flesh to save us from our sin. This is what Paul spoke about in 2 Corinthians 4, 3. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to those that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine in them or shine upon them. You see, there are some people whose eyes are blinded to Christ. And according to God's word, they have not seen him. They may know about him, but they have rejected Christ in their heart. And the reality is that they don't know him. Notice that in verse 6. They have not seen him, neither known him. Now this would be in reference, of course, to an unsaved man. Someone that has never known God. John's point is simple and straightforward. Sin is a product of ignorance and blindness toward God. Sin can never come out of seeing and knowing God. It, is, it can never be a part of the experience of abiding in Christ. If you are abiding in Christ, then your life will manifest the life of Christ. Can an abiding person stumble? Yes. Will there be conviction? And should there be repentance? Yes. Though the believer will sin, he will not continually ignore his relationship in abiding with Christ. The natural man uh, may stumble and will sin, 
But the fact is that in your life as a believer, the new man will convict and will guide and will lead us back into fellowship. Again, the unsaved man has no desire for that. Turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians 12 as we close tonight. 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, rather, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 2, 12. It says, Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. Now look at verse 6 back in 1 John 3. It says, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither know him. The natural man has not received the Spirit of God. He does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. That's why he continues in sin and does not know God and does not care about God. The man who has Jesus living in him should be abiding in him. And as we're abiding in him, we're sinning not. There may be occasion when... Someone that has Christ in them stumbles and sins and has not yet apprehended. And when that happens, we should repent, which is why we give an altar call at this church. In case we haven't repented through the week, we should repent and restore that fellowship. And that is our responsibility. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we thank God for that. But when someone can go, and I I hesitate to put a timetable because God does not, So I will simply say a length of time in sin, transgressing the law without a thought, without conviction. They won't be restored. They won't hear. They won't listen. Their children are crying. Their wife is pleading. They don't care. They just keep going on. I would simply say to you, according to the word of God, He hath not seen him, neither known him. Because if you know him, you know the difference he can make. And if you know him, you don't want to grieve him. And if you know him, when you do fall into that pig's pen, you want to come to him and say, Lord, with your word, cleanse me. I want fellowship with you. I cannot tell you the number of times of sin or months or years I can only say that someone who lives in habitual, continual sin, in the present tense of sin for all of these times continually, the Bible says they didn't know him. Friend, let's not live this week as though Jesus isn't there. Let's practice his presence. Let's not treat him like the guy that we don't want to interrupt our conversation Let's make him the center of our conversation. Let's abide in him. Because if we abide in him, we're not going to sin. This is why the Bible says walk in the spirit. Just walk constantly in the spirit. And you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Let's look at verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him. A saved, abiding Christian will live a life of victory. When there is no victory, it is probably the result of no abiding. An unsaved man hath not known him. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, as I said, I cannot tell you that. I have not followed you around all this past six months. But if you're living a life that is not real. If there's a hidden you, a double standard, then I would encourage you strongly tonight to come at this altar call and turn from that hidden life of sin and ask Jesus Christ to save you. There's no embarrassment in that. I remember talking 
to Brother Tykert some years ago. And he was telling me about when he got saved here at our church. I think I remember the story correctly. Brother John had been coming under conviction. He came to our church about the time a college girl who was prominent in the college had been saved. I believe she was baptized here in the church and perhaps a comment was made Perhaps I made the comment, I cannot remember. Here is a young lady who came to our college who was a Bible college student who realized that she had never been saved. And she got saved in college chapel and she's here to get baptized. Brother Tykert said when that testimony was given, he knew that he needed to be saved. Not only is salvation the right thing for your life, it may be the thing that brings revival for others as well. If you're living that double life, if your life is a habitual life of sin, won't you come to the Savior tonight? Find the joy that he can give you. It's okay. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Come to him and let him save you. If you have stumbled into the pig's pen, there's sin in your life. Listen, would you please come to Christ as a believer and repent of it? He, he, will, know, he, he, he will welcome you as did the, the father of the prodigal. He'll welcome you. Don't stay in the pig's pen. Come. Come to the Lord in repentance.